We've been marching our way. If you haven't been here through the book of John, we're in John chapter 15, where Jesus gives his last of the seven I am statements. I am the true vine. He takes the name God from Exodus chapter 3 when he was speaking to Moses. And, you know, Moses asked him, well, who should I say sent me? And he says, well, you tell him I am that I am. He uses that ego I me in the Hebrew to take the very name of God and tells them that I am the vine. <laughs> I feel a little bit inadequate to try to teach this sermon to you. This is the, this is the uh, strongest chapter in the Bible about remaining in God, remaining in Jesus. You ever have a question about whether or not you have to remain in Jesus? Go to John chapter 15. Over 10 times he's going to tell his disciples and his apostles, you must remain in me. Outside of me, you can do nothing. One of the biggest problems we have as Christians today in this Western civilization world we live in is because we don't quite understand the idea that you can do nothing outside of God. And I don't care what goodness you think it is. I don't care if it's fishing you find happiness in. I don't care if it's basket weaving. I don't care what it is you do. Outside of God, you will never find the joy, he says in these verses, that he offers. In, this, in John chapter 15, verse 11, he says, I wrote these things so that your joy can be complete. Jesus, I, I've told you this before, he was in the upper room. I believe he's probably left the upper room now. Then you look back, I think he got up, and the Bible might say. I believe he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's had the meal. He's washed the feet. He's given all those stories that he's told. And I honestly believe he's probably on his way to the garden if he's not in the garden. I think he's taken on. Because today he's going to say, I am the vine. I am the true vine. And you are the branches. And it is my father, the gardener, who takes care of them. And there's two types of people in this story. Outside of Jesus and the father. The branches that produce fruit and the branches that don't produce fruit. And Jesus, I don't believe, is given a sermon. He's walking with his 12 disciples. And like Jesus does many times, when he sees a wedding, he gives a story about a wedding. <laughs> when he sees a well, he talks about living water. And I believe he saw vines, whether he was in the garden or whether he was on his way. And I believe he's probably taken a, a very slow stroll. Because when he gets to the garden... He'll be arrested. And shortly after that, he'll go to Caiaphas. Shortly after that, he'll be on a cross. And I don't think he's preaching to his 11 disciples. If I could set the tone, I think he might have just said, guys. We, we, I think there could have been a couple tones that he might have used. One might have been, you know, kind of stern. and said, stop arguing about who's the greatest, right? That's what they were doing. Hey, who's going to be on your right and who's on your left? Who's going to be... Who's going to be number one in charge of this? And I think he might have said, guys, <laughs> you missed the point. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Life comes from me. I'm the source of life. Without me, you can't do anything. But something tells me he might have been the kind of person I picture a lot and he might just have said look guys you see these vines I'm the vine come here I think he might have gave them all a big hug and he said inside without me you can't do anything it's going to be okay I got to go away I told you I got to leave but I'm the vine and in me is life and you don't have to worry about it because you know we talked about this last time when I leave I'm going to send the spirit and the spirit's going to dwell within you and me and my father will come and make our home with you. You won't be alone. Life will be within you, the vine, the source, the strength that you need. And I really think that's 
probably more what Jesus is doing is walking and talking with his disciples on his way, taking a slow stroll to the cross. And he's going to tell them, look, guys, I got what you need. Now, here's, here's what I fear when we read John chapter 15 sometimes. Because, you know, we have a pretty strong stance on you can fall away and lose your salvation. Other groups don't have that stance. I don't think that's what Jesus is teaching. <laughs> I, don't, I, I find very few scriptures in the Bible, if any, actually that even talk about drifting away. I think it's our way of watering down the truth. You're either in or you're out. I don't think we like to hear that. And so we find middle ground somewhere to say, well, you know, we're just backsliding a little bit. <laughs> I don't think that's what Jesus is teaching at all. I think he's teaching, if you claim to be a child of God, and you have no fruit, he would say like Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and with your mouth not do what, or with your mouth call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Let's stop playing a game. Because one day in Matthew chapter 7, he's going to show up, depart from me. But Lord, we've done all these things. We've cast out demons in your name. We've done many things in your name. Depart from me, your worker of iniquity. I don't know you. There's no middle ground. There's no one foot in, one foot out. There's no per se backsliding. Everybody falls. Everybody's got to get up. Everybody grows at different speeds. Everybody's fruit's not the same. We're going to see that as we move through the text. I don't disagree with that. But Jesus just simply says in Matthew chapter 7, bad fruit don't grow on good trees. Good fruit don't grow on bad trees. Jesus looks at the lives of these disciples who knows they're going to be left alone. He says, fellas, you'll be okay if you stay in the vine. Because in the vine you'll produce fruit because you'll have life. And my father, the gardener, will make sure the soul is all taken care of. And you can have joy. The, the shame about this story is that we want to argue about in or out. And the truth is what Jesus is saying, you must be in me, the source of life to have life. And if you're not, the sad part is you're robbing yourself of the life he wants to give you. He wants you to have joy complete. And joy is not happiness. Happiness is based more upon the fact whether or not I got a new car today. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> and then the car breaks down. Oh, I'm not happy. Happiness comes and goes upon how I'm feeling and things, environments around me. Joy is a choice that you make. Biblical joy is a choice that you make to put trust in Jesus Christ and to believe that he can deliver what he said he could deliver. And so that you can have hope that when you die, you won't stay in the grave, but you'll be resurrected. That's joy. Joy is a conscious decision to decide to do right. And when you find yourself in situations that aren't going the way you want them to go, joy is the part where you say, God, I believe you're still in charge. We'll see that if we won't go through some of this text because he's going to prune the branches. Now, if I was to prune, I'm terrible at pruning. I'm assuming pruning isn't, I've never pruned much. I'm assuming pruning isn't done by a chainsaw. <laughs> I probably wouldn't do very good, right? Weed whacker probably don't prune very well. But Jesus knows how to prune. Jesus knows how to take the dead branches and burn them up. And I would think that image would be hell. He knows how to cut the other branches delicately so that they can produce more fruit. But it's a little bit painful when Jesus says, you need a little pruning, Jesse. You need a little pruning. And you're going to go through some trials. <laughs> James 1, verse 2. I always thought James must have been crazy. <laughs> Count it all joys, my friends, when you go through all kinds of trials and tribulations. Come on, James. <laughs> I don't know anybody I've ever met in life that says, oh, boy, this is great. I'm going through a trial. Oh, God will give me another one. <laughs> Come on, James. I got something wrong here. <laughs> And then verse 3 says, 
that he's working patience in your life. I choose to believe that God, no matter what I'm going through, will work it out for good. Now, I don't have an exact verse for that, to be honest with you. I think it's more of a mental decision that we make based upon knowing what kind of God we have. You see, if I leave here today and I get in a car accident out there because I drive too fast and I'm out of control or the roads are wet, was God at work or was it my erratic driving? I don't know. You know there's a percentage, no matter what you do, there's a certain percentage that there'll be a certain number of accidents on the road every year. It don't matter what you do. But I choose to believe that God is sovereign and that God, when he prunes, is at work doing whatever he wants to do. Did he want me to hit that guy? Did that guy need a lesson? I don't know. So I choose to believe that the God I serve always, always is at work in my life to make me better. And that he can make something good out of it. So when we get into the pruning, I, I want you to think about that. Because things will come your way in life. And if they haven't come, they're coming. You won't escape this world without some kind of trial. You'll have to decide for yourself. Do you quit or do you keep going? I choose to believe that the God I serve is in control. And he's working out. What he wants for me in my life. So he can make me more like Jesus. This is what Jesus is teaching these disciples. I want to read you something from F.F. F. Bruce. And then, we'll, and then we'll get into the text. He's an old, uh, he's an old man. F.F. F. Bruce, I mean, long, long time ago. Probably in, uh, I don't know how far back he'd go. Quite a ways. He was, uh, uh, shoot, I forgot now. But... Um, He, he, he wrote something about John 15 that I think is impactful. So I want to read it to you. He says, this is his words. John 15 verses 4 and 6. He says, what, it, what is meant by the expression, unless you abide or by the quote, what if a man does not abide? Is it possible not to abide in Christ? Passages like these are not difficult in themselves. The difficult arises when we try to make them and other scriptures square with our theology. Instead of using them as a basis for our theology at the very time our Lord was speaking, there was a glaring example of one who failed to abide in him, Judas Iscariot, who has just left the upper room. Judas was chosen as the, his 11 colleagues were. Their association with the Lord brought them no privileges which were not equally open to Judas. The plain passage of scripture which teach the final perseverance of saints should not be misused as an excuse of soft peddling the equally plain passages of the danger of apostasy. In other words, you could go over here to John chapter 10 and he's going to say, you, you can't be snatched out of the hand of God. And then he'll actually say, God has you and Jesus has you and many of our friends will teach, therefore you can't fall. If that, if that was the true meaning of that passage, then what was written here would, would, would conflict. They don't conflict in my teaching. Nobody will snatch you out of the hand of God. The question is, are you in the hand of God? Are you bearing fruit? And we'll see that. Let's read some of this. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. Oh, here, I'll give you the... <laughs> there, thank you. Bob was ahead of it. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. There's no truer vine than Jesus Christ. There's no false statement. He's the true vine. If there's a true vine, I would argue with you, there's a false vine. In this sentence, Jesus is talking, this text is written by a Jewish man, Jesus, to a bunch of Jewish believers. His disciples. In the Old Testament, and I've got some scriptures in here I'll show you, Israel was considered a vine. In Isaiah chapter 5, that vine was plucked up, plucked up out of uh, Egyptian bondage moved over to the promised land and God dug and planted and the vine did great until they rejected God. On Solomon's temple is a gold vine. There are scriptures all over the Old Testament talk about Israel being the vine. 
The problem is the vine rejected God. The vine had every opportunity. The gardener took care of it. Israel could have been everything God wanted it to be. And chose not to be. See, I believe Jesus is using this imagery to, to, to these men. But he says, I'm the true vine. I'm not the false vine. You can put your trust in me. In me is life. And they had seen everything he had done. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So there's no doubt that he cuts off every branch in him that bears no fruit. He says, while every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Verse 3, you, you are already cleansed, clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Oh, yeah, I'll go up to verse 4 here. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So... Verse 5, I'm the vine. If you are the branches, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. <laughs> you can see all the remains. <laughs> if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. There's no greater chapter in the Bible about remaining in Jesus Christ. If you don't get it as you move through these, you can't miss them. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you, may, you, you my joy may be, uh, I'm sorry, this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is why he wrote this. He wants you to have complete joy. But you can't miss the text that you must remain in Jesus. And you can't miss the, miss the text that if, if you don't bear fruit, he cuts the branch off. And he burns the branch. And the imagery is not something that you can't put your head around. 12 says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now that's <laughs> a hard one to bear fruit, huh? What fruit? Love one another as I loved you. You think about it as I move through this lesson. If you have somebody that you don't love in the kingdom of God, you should see warning, warning, warning. You may have somebody in here you don't like. You may have somebody in other congregations. You may have somebody, I don't know. But don't miss the warning. To bear fruit in Jesus Christ is to remain in his love and to love others as he loved them. And if you have something going on in your life that needs to be addressed, I, you know, I could jump to the conclusion, right? You need to address it. Because if you don't, you'll, there's just big warning lights. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down his life for his friend. 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. So Jesus and God are one. We've, we've gone through all of that. He calls you friends because he's given you the word. This is, <laughs> could be part of the conclusion I had it. <laughs> we're going to skip and go a little bit here. But one of the most dangerous things about listening to sermons is you're being held accountable. You can't leave here this morning. And not have heard the words, you must remain in Jesus. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And I don't know what it might be going on in your life as far as a sense of how you love, don't love. Whether you stay obedient to the commandments, whether you obey. Whether you pray, because he talks about praying in his text, ask, meaning praying, I'll give you. Whether you have joy. If you don't have joy in your life, warning, warning, warning. Because the text says that's part of the fruit bearing that you're to do as a child of God. You think about that. 
You don't need much of an invitation. 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Now this is so funny because I say funny, but you know that text is so misused by all these health and wealth preachers today. Whatever you ask. Has that really been your experience? Just put a litmus test on it. I know it hasn't been in my life. If it was, I'd be living in a mansion and driving a Ferrari. <laughs> There's all kinds of things in the Bible that tell you you must be like the persistent willow. You must ask and ask and ask and ask and not give up. James says you don't have because you don't ask. James says you don't have because you ask for the wrong reasons. And just because you stick the name of Jesus on the end of a prayer, don't mean you get what you ask for. Because sometimes if God gave you what you asked for, he'd be nothing more than a spoiled brat. Praying in the name of Jesus is saying, Lord, your will be done, not mine. Praying in the name of Jesus is saying, Lord, I don't, I don't understand what is going on. I don't understand how this is going to work out for good. I don't know what you want done in this, but I pray your will will be done, not mine. Now, those kinds of prayers will get answered. Problem is, is they, we don't consider them answered unless they're answered the way we want them answered. If you are a child of God, the Bible promises the world next week, the world will hate you because it hated me. We get offended because we think we're Christians and we should get a 10% discount. It's not the way it works. So I'm the true vine. Ego, I mean, I told you this. Jesus signs his name to himself. <laughs> It must have been a false line. I told you about Psalms 88 through 9. This is where he transplanted him. He took him up out of Egypt. I just want you to know it's in the Bible. <laughs> Isaiah 5. What, what more could have been done for my vineyard that I have done for? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? This is the picture of God taking Israel, planting them in the promised land, giving them whatever they need, and yet they produce no fruit. What would you say about your life? What has God not given you that you need that you could produce fruit? Are you going to blame God on the day he returns and say, Well, Lord, I would have just done more if you would have just... Trust me, the gardener is at work in your life. And the gardener is tilling the soul. And the gardener is taking care of the vine. The gardener is trimming the branches. And you should be producing fruit. And I should be producing fruit. Jesus is the true vine that would produce abundant fruit for the Father. These are, I just put these if you want to write them down. These are all kinds of other verses in the Old Testament that will talk about Israel, but usually in a negative sense, in the sense that the vine has not done what it was supposed to do. The vine, in other words, went looking after other gods. They had other idols. They put other things before God. And the true vine is born... The word comes into the world and puts on flesh so that you and me could live. And now Jesus is that vine. I think the church now is really the, the new, new vine. If you, Not the new vine, but I think it's the new Israel. I say that to you not because we show up and we say, well, I have to become a Jew. I got to go to the synagogue. I got to keep the Mosaic law. Absolutely not. Romans 2 says that circumcision is no longer of the body, but it's of the heart. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, I'm going to write you a new covenant. And in that covenant, I'm going to write my laws on your hearts and on your minds. We are the new branches and Jesus in that vine in the sense that when he comes is the new temple. And we as the branches worship that temple. Jesus, I mean, Israel has a unique place in the sense that God used them to bring the message to the world through his son, Jesus Christ. But today he uses the church. And today you have the, the spirit, you have the trinity of God living in you. And you are to produce fruit. If you don't produce fruit, you'll be like the false vine. And you'll be unfit and cast out and burned. And I know things can get tough. Because you will be pruned as well. There are four persons. I told you in this story. You got Jesus, God, and then the two people, which is us. 
John 15 compels us to see that there's much more available in Jesus Christ. This, the text is really wants you to get the understand, idea that you're connected to the very source of life. If you just disconnect yourself from that life, what do you have? One reason a lot of people give up on Christianity or, or isn't happy or don't have joy is because they're not connected to the source. They're out trying to produce everything else they can produce. That's why sometimes all the gimmicks we do in the church don't work. Because they have nothing to do with the vine. You've got to stay connected to the vine. John 10.10 10 talks about the thief that comes and steals and destroys. The most basic principle of this metaphor is that Jesus is the source of life. I'm the true vine. Hebrews 9.12, this is the easy to read version, says, He entered the most holy place by using his own blood, not the blood of goats or, or young bulls. He entered there and made us free from sin forever. This is what Jesus did. He's the source. Why is he the source? Because he's the one who came and gave his own blood to pay for your sins and my sins. That's the source we're to stay connected to. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't win this position by a lottery ticket. <laughs> he came and he died. He chose. He gave his life to pay for our penalties and our sins. And that's why he's the source of life. Do you want life? I would tell you to turn to Jesus. He can give you life. These are, this is the number of times that remains were used in, in, in this text, like about 10 different times. I probably didn't even cover them all. You can't miss the point. You must remain in me. You must remain in my commandments. You must obey my commandments. You must remain. If once you detach yourself from the vine, you will die. That's clear. We might not like it, but it's clear. You can't miss the point. But yeah, but there's other, yeah, there's a lot of other scriptures. <laughs> Doesn't lessen this scripture. God dis disciplines those he loves. You know, this, this got to be one of the hardest things that I try to explain. But if God loves me, why did this happen to me? I don't know that I have a great answer. I heard it said one time like this that I, that I kind of like. Faith until it's knocked off its feet doesn't know it has wings. And I don't know why all these things happen sometimes to good people. Again, I just choose to believe that faith, when it's knocked off its feet, will find its wings. I choose to believe that if I don't give up on God, that there'll be light at the end of the tunnel. And that when I come out, I will come out better than when I went in. Maybe that's why Daniel went in the lion's den. Maybe that's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was thrown into the fiery furnace. I've had a lot of moments in my life where I felt like I was in the fiery furnace and I didn't want to be there. I'm thankful that I had enough faith to believe that God was there with me. And hang on long enough that I would come out the other end. Did that make everything perfect, easy when I was in the middle of that trial? Absolutely not. But what it does tell me. You serve a God that loves you so much that he will prune you when you need pruned. He will discipline you just like your earthly father disciplines you according to the Bible. You, you mean God disciplines? Absolutely. What kind of God would he be if he didn't care for you enough to turn you around when you were going in the wrong direction? Is that the kind of God you'd want to serve? That would let you reach your final destiny and say, I'm sorry, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you because, you know, he wouldn't help you. God will help you along the trail. If you'll just listen, he'll prune you. And we don't like it. But the truth is he will. God will remove every branch that bears no fruit. God prunes the branches that, that, bear, bear, that bear fruit. So, I mean, <laughs> this is interesting because you're bearing fruit. <laughs> Why are you pruning me, God? I'm bearing fruit. I'm doing what you asked me to do. Isn't that enough? He said, no, Jesse. I'm going to prune you. Next, next year, you're going to bear even more fruit. I'm not leaving you where you are. Sometimes pruning happens because of our own mistakes. 
Sometimes we have to pay consequences for our sins in life. I believe that's true. Sometimes God says, you got some growing to do. I like that it's better to bleed than it is to burn. I'd rather suffer a little bit now on earth and have to go through a trial or a tribulation to make sure that when God came back and I stand before my maker and I give an account of my life that I'm not so short because I didn't bear the trial or the tribulation. God is sovereign, I told you that. I, I, did, I just choose to believe that. That he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and he knows it a lot better than me. So what, what kind of fruit? This is interesting. If you, you know, if you go over to, I think it's in Matthew, but this Matthew 13, and we'll, we'll stop here. But you know, Matthew 13 has these, just to give you an idea of this text here, but you know how it fits in our text, but it has the four soils. The seed is sown upon a hard ground, a, a pathway where it can never grow, and it's just tra- or ate up by the birds or trampled. No germination. The other three souls all have germination. The one, on the, the one on the soil that's just shallow grows up and the sun withers it and it dies out. You got the good soil. What was the other one? You got rocky soil maybe? No. Uh, weedy? Yeah. Thorny. Well, weeds are going to grow up anyways, right? You're going to choke it out. I can't remember. So, but, so you got those that got choked out by the weeds, burned up by the sun, and those that produce. The other one never germinates. It's not about germination. This, this really throws a... a, a, a uh, 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 I don't know what to call it. It, it, it makes us change our thinking. Because we think a lot of times it's all about faith, faith, faith. He, he, Jesus says here it's about fruit, fruit, fruit. He doesn't say that. They all germinate. Those three souls germinate. Only one produces the fruit. You don't produce fruit. You're not in Jesus. Now, the fruit don't matter. What kind of fruit? A lot of people ask me, what kind of fruit do I, got, do I have to have, preacher? Text don't say. In, 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 in the text in John, I would say, well, he would say you pray, you obey, all those kinds of things. We could go to the fruit of the Spirit, and there's other places in the Bible. But the truth here, he says there's some 100-fold, 60-fold, some 30-fold. Doesn't matter how much. Don't think it matters what kind. As long as it's good fruit. The Spirit don't give any bad gifts. You might be a housewife. That's good fruit. Be the best housewife you can be. You might be a lumberjack. You, you, you might be a janitor. You, you might be all kinds of things. Some people say, oh, preaching, is the be- preaching ain't the best fruit. The best fruit is any fruit that's willing to do the work of God. Hear me, send I. That's the best fruit. And so this, this is what he's talking about. Uh, so let's just leave it here. I told you this a little bit, but one man told me that about the danger of you coming here and hearing what I just said or listening to any sermon. Is you can't no longer say you haven't heard that you must remain in Jesus. And you must bear fruit. And I'm not trying to tell you how much. And I'm not trying to tell you what kind. But if you have no joy in your life, you have no... Ev- fruit doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Fruit is the evidence that you met the man, Jesus. And that he meant something to you. If you read further in this text, you'll talk about the word and you'll talk about Jesus. And he talks about him as the same. I believe the gospel is, is the, the, it's the same thing. It's a person calling you. The person, Jesus Christ, by the words of God. But you can't leave here the same. If you, leave, if you know right now in your life and you say to yourself, I've got stuff in my life that I know is not in alignment with God's word. But I refuse to change. That's danger. If, you, if you've heard this text and you know that there's no fruit in your life or there's rotten fruit in your life and you go out those doors and you don't change, you will be burned up cast away that's not a text we like to talk about this is a serious serious subject if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus we want you to know Jesus we want you to know the source of life that can save you if you've never been born again we'd like to offer you that in baptism to make your commitment to God to openly profess who you are that you believe in him I mean 
have your sins washed away, risen to walk in a newness of life. Why? So you could produce fruit. So if you're here and you have something on your mind you want to share, maybe you got something going, please come as we stand and sing. Sure.